Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. I heard loons again. Oh man, I love me some loons. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. Hello, Scott. Fantastic. Yeah. No flies on you. Nope. I got comedy. How was your Halloween? Oh, it was fantastic. It was, I had a great time. Carol laughed that you said your dog's costume was going to be a little ladybug, and it actually was. It was a little ladybug, yeah. Uh, he was not jazzed about this uh, costume. No, he seemed a little cold, actually. Well, that's his problem, isn't it? Yeah, fair enough. Dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on any of the topics we present, nor are we professional journalists. We're just two regular Canadians interested in crime and the darker side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double, and an Anaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Jump, jump, jump. Om nom nom nom. Om nom nom. This is episode 47, and the first episode of our second year in existence. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. We made it an entire year. We're still speaking to each other, <laughs> although there were just some dicey times. <laughs> well, you know, like any family, uh, there's going to be some conflict. Yeah. But we plug through and we improve and get better. Our Halloween episode was a lot of fun, and we've gotten some really positive feedback from folks, and they enjoyed everybody's spooky stories. Yeah, I, I had a I had a blast uh, listening to it and recording for that one. And yeah, we had a really good time, Scott. You actually told a story. This I time. did. I did. I know. So yeah. we got you over that hump. Yeah. Well, look, I'm talking about anything at any point in time for as long as possible, as long as I don't have to write anything. There you go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We have had that conversation as well. <laughs> I'm 45, man. I don't think I'm changing my ways at this point. We've had an interesting, pretty crazy week, actually. Oh. Uh, we were on TV and we were in the paper and, and all for good things. It wasn't because we were being investigated for a crime. <laughs> Yet. I mean, who knows? Maybe one day. That'll make a great episode. But no, it was a... It's always something to aspire to, I guess. <laughs> Sure, sure. And it was a, an, an incredible week. I have never seen myself uh, as often as I as I have this week. And, uh, you know, I I mean, for Halloween, I was I was handing out autographs. Oh. Yeah, you know, kids come to the door and here, here you go. That would have been disappointing. Depends on, yeah, no, I totally would have been. I personally have been looking forward to this particular episode. Not only does it have elements of a Canadian true crime story mm -hmm. and some dark history, there's a mystery and subsequent search for treasure that's been ongoing for over a hundred years. I am such a huge fan of treasure hunting. Like I, I love hidden treasure stuff. It's, it's oh. Do you do you do that? Uh, is it geocaching? Have you ever done that? I've never done that. No. I have the geocaching app. Yeah. I have just never gone geocaching. <laughs> like, I mean, you had to pay for it. Oh, did you really? Yeah, like I even signed up, but I've just never done it. Wow, wow. And there's probably like a geocache in the backyard. I could at least start I, with something like that. I don't know if that really qualifies as like treasure hunting. Well, in a way. Well. This is a lot more interesting treasure anyway. Yes. This is the legend of Slumak and his lost gold mine, 
somewhere in the mountains of BC near Pitt Lake. Have you ever been to Pitt Lake? I absolutely have. We used to live in Maple Ridge. Yeah, I have. Uh, I had a friend who uh, had a cabin there, and I went and stayed out there one time. Cool. What wasn't located in a gold mine? Well, these events took place in 1890. So a couple of years ago. It was a very different time. Some of the language used in the quote from news reports, witness accounts, and in court documents may be offensive to a few of our listeners, especially those of indigenous descent. Mm -hmm. So we didn't write these things ourselves, nor do we endorse the language that's used. Not at all. In an effort to maintain historical accuracy and ensure the story is told, We may choose to use some of these quotes in full, and we may not. Yep. Much of what has been written about Slumok appears to be either fiction or legend, so we'll start with some of the facts that we know for sure. Eh, facts. And the facts surround a murder. Oh. An actual murder. Uh, Like a real murder. True crime murder. True crime factual murder. A factual murder. These facts have been established through multiple sources, many of which have been carefully archived by Slumok expert Fred Brackus on his website slumok.ca. And Slumok is spelled S-L-U-M-A-C-H. Yeah, you were telling me that this website is ridiculously thorough. Thorough, yeah. Yeah, the subtitle is a website for all who prefer facts over fiction. And I really appreciate Fred Brackus's research that went into this. Like, well, holy guacamole, <laughs> did he ever dive deep? Mm-hmm. And he's from Wanak, BC, which is up. Where just... is Wanak? So Wanak is between Maple Ridge and Mission. I've driven through that area. Yeah, I've never you, heard of You Wannick. have driven through Wanak. I have? Yes, you absolutely have. Wow. Is it like three houses? Pretty much. Okay. It's, it's like a spasm. <laughs> It's somebody who was very impressed that we talked about spasm. Well, they'll be doubly impressed because we've done it twice now. So this website, slumock.ca, is award-winning and worth checking out. I'm sure we will leave out numerous things and facts. And so, Fred, please don't be offended if we leave things out or if we tell the, the story haphazardly. It in no way reflects on you and the research that you've done. It just means... We didn't get there because there was so much to read. Yeah, in limited time. Absolutely. So this is the story of the apparently Mm. unprovoked murder of Louis B. by Slumok Mm. in 1890. What an interesting name, by the way. Slumok? Yeah. Yeah, it means apparently like Quiet River or something like that. Of course it does. On the 8th of September in 1890, an indigenous man named Charlie Seymour claimed that he and his friend Louis Bootlier, also known as Louis B., left their homes along the Pitt River in their canoe, heading upstream. Louis B. was a man with mixed French and indigenous heritage. The two were going to look for their sturgeon lines that morning in the hopes of catching one or more of the large and valuable fish. It's believed that under the right circumstances, sturgeon can live to more than a hundred years old. Even recently, people have been catching massive sturgeon in the region between seven and eight feet long. One fish caught in 2016 was 11.2 feet long and weighed in at 750 pounds. Not only is the caviar of a sturgeon valuable, they are prized for their flesh, which could feed a family for some time. As well, a substance in their swim bladders makes paint and glue. Their bones and cartilage can be used to make tools like needles and weapons such as arrow and spearheads. The pair found there was no bait on their hooks, so they looked around for some dead salmon to cut up and bait the lines with. After a brief and friendly encounter with the Catesy chief and his wife, the two went a little further up the river. They heard a shot and went across the river where they thought it might have come from, finding another canoe as they came ashore. Waist deep in the river, as they were pulling their canoe onto the land, the pair saw the old man they knew as Slumok, walking toward them out of the tall grass, rifle in hand. Seymour claimed Louis B. asked Slumok what he'd been firing at. Seymour stated that without further comment, Slumok leveled his gun at Louis and fired once. The bullet went through Louis's arm and chest and exited his back. 
After a weak attempt to hold himself up, grabbing the side of the canoe, Louis slumped over and sank into the water, bleeding profusely, instantly dead. Slumok ran for his own canoe to reload with Seymour screaming after him, Why did you do that? Slumok said he wanted them to go away. Seymour hid from Slumok, who seemed to be searching for him, until Slumok himself hopped into his canoe and vanished. Seymour left his canoe and made his way home by land, telling his wife and Louise what had happened. Seymour then headed to New Westminster to raise the alarm with the authorities. The next day, the coroner and Seymour came back, but couldn't find Louis B.'s body initially. After a brief search, Louis was found, still underwater. They went to Slumok's house to confront him, but the old man was not there. They did find Louis B.'s axe in Slumok's cabin. Seymour claimed it had been in the canoe. Although the pair had been known for drinking whiskey and being unruly, Seymour claimed that neither he nor Louis had been drinking that day. The coroner's inspection of Louis's body showed the bullet had passed through a lung and his heart killing him. There was no evidence that Louis had been drinking that day at all. The hunt was on for Slumok, now being called a maniac. From a piece in the Daily Columbian on 9th of September, 1890, hunters and fishermen were warned to be on their guard as the maniac was on the loose. Quote, the Indians say that Slumok has always acted strangely, and at regular intervals would withdraw himself alone into the forest that border the mountains around the lake and remain there for weeks, reappearing at the end of these periods of aberration, looking haggard and more like a savage beast than a human being. In spite of his lunacy, however, the maniac never displayed any signs of hostility nor gave indications that his freedom was dangerous to human life. He is described as a very powerful man and is rather dreaded by his own Indian friends, end quote. Hmm. Hmm. Right? Somebody is dead in the water. And they don't know where Slumok is. So on the 13th of September, two police constables had a run-in with Slumok who had the drop on them. Hmm. And he was aiming his rifle at them when they saw him. Quickly, without aiming, one constable fired his own rifle in Slumok's direction, causing Slumok to miss his own shot. The constable fired again before Slumok could squeeze off another shot, missing him again, but this time sending the fugitive scampering for safety on his hands and knees. Hmm. Yeah, I'm assuming these aren't quick load guns. No. <laughs> well, eh, 1890s, they could have been. Well, you you could be, have revolvers. Yeah. You know, I don't think there's going to be a high magazine <laughs> firearms. The police pursued him and upon seeing him running through a field, fired two more shots after him, missing with both. In late October, over a month later, police had starved old Slumok out. Mm. Emaciated after days without eating, he gave himself up to authorities and was thrown into the New Westminster jail under the care of a doctor. I wonder if that's the same uh, jail that is currently in New West. No. He's <laughs> just quick with the answer. Why are you asking these questions? Because I, was, I was raised there and I'm fascinated <laughs> by New Westminster. <laughs> On November 3rd, 1890, just over a week after his arrest, Slumak appeared in court for a preliminary hearing. There it was determined that he would be tried two weeks later for the murder of Louis B. So not only is it just moments later, it seems like you're in court yeah. for a preliminary hearing. Like, now it takes years to get to that point. Well, what, seemingly. What was the population in New West at that time? Five. Four, Fourteen, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wasn't that big. No. It wasn't New West the actual capital of it was. British Columbia at that yeah. time? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was the queen came through. Slumok pled not guilty to the charge. Slumok's trial began on the 14th of November, so two weeks after you're arrested, you're on trial. Yeah, we're not going to see those days again. No. So the trial began on the 14th of November, and it was finished on the 15th of November. <laughs> what the hell? Even though evidence came forward that Louis B. was known to be confrontational and threatening at points, it wasn't enough to save Slumok, hmm. even though he was claiming self-defense. Yeah, yeah. So he wasn't denying. No. At 3.45, the jury went to deliberate the case, and just as quickly, only 15 minutes later, they came back with a verdict. I mean, I've had flus that last longer than his case. Exactly. Slumok was found guilty of the cold-blooded murder of Louis B. 
Justice Drake sentenced Slumock to hang on January 16th, 1891 on the gallows at the New West Jail. Wow. Wow. So not only are you found guilty very quickly, your sentence is also going to be carried out very quickly as well. I guess there was no such thing as a peel at that. <laughs> no, 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 just a banana peel. Uh-huh. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. After a last minute conversion to Christianity, where he took the name Peter, Slumok was brought to the gallows and the sentence was carried out. From the Daily Columbian on January 17th, 1891, quote, Slumok walked firmly up the steps leading to the platform and faced the crowd below. The hangman quickly adjusted the noose, and Father Morgan commenced a prayer. Then the black cap was put on, and at eight o'clock exactly, the bolt was drawn, the trap fell, and Slumok had paid the penalty of his crime. Yeah, that's a crazy feeling hearing hearing about this because, like, again, having spent a lot of my life in New West, you know, I, I, I never envisioned a hanging taking place there with a crowd. There was a judge in New West called the Hanging Judge. Really? Yes, we'll do a story on him, wow. too. Back to our newspaper quote. The hanging was very ably managed, and beyond a few little twitching of the hands and feet, the body remained perfectly still after the drop. In three minutes and 58 seconds, life was pronounced extinct. But it was more than 20 minutes before the body was cut down and placed in the coffin. Coroner Pittendre and a jury viewed the body and brought in the usual verdict. Slumok's neck was broken in the fall, and death must have been painless. The drop was eight feet, five inches. Yeesh. End quote. Yeesh. There were 50 witnesses to the hanging itself and a larger crowd, some of Slumok's family, waited outside of the jail. And what they used to do, after the hanging was complete, they would raise a black flag over the jail mm. so people would know that it that, was yeah. complete. Yeah. yeah, okay. Slumok was buried at St. Peter's Catholic Church Cemetery in Sapperton, Block 9, Lot 13A, under the name Peter Slumok and the year 1891. You can go visit that if, you, if you'd like. I think we should. One of the sources of the rumors about Slumok may have been from the man who helped him convert to Christianity as he waited his death sentence. Many years after Slumok's death, in 1972, an indigenous woman named Amanda Charnley or Aunt Mandy told an interesting story that her father, Peter Pierre, had told her and her siblings. He was the man who had helped convert. Slumok. Mm, okay. Donald E. Waite, who was investigating Slumok's legend at the time, spoke with Aunt Mandy and recorded her story. Mandy said that her father, Peter Pierre, was a catechist from the Roman Catholic Order of Mary Immaculate and a medicine man on the Catesy Indian Reserve. He was also Slumok's nephew. <laughs> Slumok told Pierre on the day of the shooting he'd shot a deer. As he was going to retrieve it, he said he saw Louis B. coming ashore with his axe over his head yelling, I'm going to chop your damn head off. Okay. Slumok, who was almost 80 at the time, feared the younger man after numerous run-ins over the years. He shot Louis B., frightened he might actually follow through on his threat. Mm, Okay, all right. It was here at the prison that Slumok admitted to Pierre about his gold find in pit country. Mm. Slumok claimed that a couple of decades prior, while hunting, he'd been given a handful of bullets molded from gold by some indigenous men from Port Douglas. He met them in the wilderness near Glacier Lake. Hmm. Well, you can't kill vampires with gold bullets, though. They told him they'd found the gold in a place called Third Canyon. Hmm. Slumok went to the area they'd mentioned, but it was getting dark, so he spent the night in the canyon. He chose a moss-covered rock on the west side of the river as his bed. In the morning, as the sun came up, Slumok was playing with the moss on the stone and peeling it back. He noticed something glinting. It was a yellow metal. He assumed it to be gold. As one would. He filled his shot bag with nuggets of the metal. The bag was about the size needed to hold 10 pounds worth of sugar, so a sizable find filled to the brim. Mm-hmm. Yeah, back then I would imagine its worth would be substantial. Well, Slumok didn't know that. He took the bag to a storekeeper in New Westminster, and the storekeeper gave Slumok $27 for the entire bag. I wonder what the worth would be equivalent to now. It's got to be still a good chunk of change, just not what it's worth. If this was actually gold, Slumok had been ripped off terribly, which he later realized. Here's some math for you. Conservatively, the bag may have contained a volume of about one and a half liters. Okay. 
That comes out to almost 64 pounds of gold by volume, around 1,022 ounces. Wow. Gold was worth $25 per ounce in 1869, around the time Slumach claimed he had made his initial find. The actual worth at the time would have been $25,500 thereabouts. Wow, okay, so uh, more than a, a puck or two. However, the purchasing power of the dollar was 18.32 times higher than mm. that of the dollar today. Makes sense. This makes Slumox find worth just over $486,000. He's just from that one bag. Yeah, but... Wow. But... $25. The price of gold today is inflated even further. Mm. So, 1,022... Ounces, ounces mm. at today's price of about $1,232 is $1.25 million. Holy bejeebus. <laughs> wow. So Slumach got ripped off pretty, pretty handily. <laughs> yeah, I'd say. Slumach wow. said the store owner closed up shop only weeks after and moved back to England. <laughs> yeah. He claimed that this was the only gold he'd removed from the region. Okay, interesting. Mm. Slumac drew Pierre a map on the bench they were sitting on in the prison, and later, from memory, Pierre redrew it a couple mm. of times. Okay. In the 1890s, just a few years after Slumac's execution, Pierre tried himself to go up into the mountains to find his claim. Mm -hmm. After a fall that broke his hip and required a lengthy hospital stay, he gave up. Yeah, that'll do it. All the copies of the all the copies of the map. Pierre redrew were lost in a house fire some years later. No. No, right. Ugh. As well, the real Slumok became lost to history, and all that was left were rumors of a maniacal native prospector who'd lurked in the hills, murdering anyone who dared follow him to protect his hidden cache of riches. Well, it does make for an interesting story. Pierre told a few people over the years about the map and Slumok's gold find. But, like with the telephone game, the legend grew and the true story becomes distorted. Yeah, who knows how far from the truth it is now. Gold fever had come to the region years earlier. In fact, the Fraser Canyon Gold Rush began in 1858. And that's when maps had been distributed in San Francisco, claiming the unclaimed riches throughout British Columbia. <laughs> the legend goes that Slumok had struck gold somewhere in the hills around Pitt Lake and the weeks he would spend away and the weeks he was away... He would spend mining and squirreling away his riches in various hiding spots. <laughs> he didn't want to get ripped off again. Yeah, I, I, I guess I can understand that back in those days. One unsubstantiated piece of gossip said that Slumok was said to have murdered 10 men before white settlers became more entrenched in the region, making him look even crazier. Yeah, I'm skeptical of that. Also, according to legend... Slumok, a cranky and unattractive man, had begun showing up in New West with a heavy backpack filled with gold nuggets as big as walnuts. That would be very heavy. Yes. He'd buy booze and the company of local prostitutes with his wealth before scattering some on the floor for the greedy white men to scrap over. Mm -hmm. It was said that Slumok would get his fill of women and whiskey before disappearing for another few months, only to come back and do the same thing over and over again. Again, with his backpack full of heavy nuggets of gold. Okay. Another legend stated that every time Slumok left, he took a different local woman with him. At least eight women are said to have gone missing. Hmm. These women would be found floating in the Pit River, having drowned at Slumok's hand after he tired of them. Yeah, I'm... I'm mm -hmm. But... Rumor. Yeah, rumors, right? Yeah. One fictional character that arose out of the legend is that of Molly Tynan. She was said to have been of mixed Chinese and Irish heritage, a true beauty. Working as a Chinese interpreter, she heard about the man Slumok and all the gold he was bringing into town every few months. Oh, okay. She set about to snag him in a trap and find out the location of the gold mine where he was acquiring his treasure. She pretended to be a waitress at a local saloon and Slumok fell for her. He took her to the mountains with him when he next left town. Legend has it that Slumak was on to her ruse, and as the two paddled up to Pit Lake, Slumak sunk his hunting knife into Molly's back. Boy, a lot of rumors about him murdering. As she screamed, he was said to have dumped her over to the side into the cold waters of the lake where she died. And it's a very deep lake. Yeah. It was said that she was later found by a fisherman, Slumak's distinctive knife still lodged in her back. Mm. The legend had this as the crime that Slumok was rushed to the gallows for. 
Oh. When we actually know it was actually killing yeah, we know Louis B. Truth. Although unreported in any of the papers at the time of his death, the legend maintains also that right before Slumak was hanged, with the bag over his head, he was said to have whispered to the executioner, Mika Memus, mine Memus. Or translated, I'm not sure from what actual language, I die, mine dies. Mm. Scott and I will take a break here. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk about the trials of many of the treasure hunters looking for Slumok's lost gold mine, some of who died in the effort. Oh, I can't wait. Not for their deaths, but you know. Break time. And we're back. Woohoo! There were other things that led to the belief of gold in them in our hills. Mm -hmm. Possibly a lost gold mine, possibly linked to Slumok, although it took a while for him to be added to the legend. Ah, okay. Just over a decade after his death, in 1903, a man named George Moody brought $1,200 of rough gold into town in a vegetable tin. Oh. He refused to say how long it took him to acquire this amount and was cagey about where he'd found it. Mm -hmm. He said there was plenty more where this came from. And that's that's fact? Like this? Like this? this is a newspaper article. Oh, okay, well, you know, that's... Uh... Another article in 1905 claimed a native man finding $1,600 worth of dust in the area, mm -hmm. and then later bringing another $1,400 haul. So that's all intriguing. That's some substantial value and some you know, good amount of gold. Yep. In 1906, there was a court case claiming ownership of $8,000 worth of nuggets that had been buried somewhere by a man now dead. Apparently, it's still up there somewhere. Oh, let's go. $8,000 worth of gold nuggets back then. I'll grab the tent. <laughs> In July of 1910, two gold prospectors, George Blake and his son George Jr. of Coquitlam, went missing in the mountains near Pit Lake. Mm. Their remains were later found in their tent. Oh. A tree had fallen on them as they slept. Their dog, found deceased and tied up nearby, had starved to death. Oh, poor dog. Poor that. What an interesting way to go. Yeah, just smooshed by yeah. a tree, in, I guess, in your sleep. Yeah. Hopefully quick. Hopefully. Yeah. In 1915, a newspaper article mentioned a 72-year-old man from Washington State named Wilbur Armstrong inspired by the story of Slumox Gold and that of another man, had been searching the region every summer for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. This was his last trip due to his advancing age. He'd been given a map by a friend who claimed this was Walter Jackson's map. Mm. Walter had brought $8,000 worth of nuggets out of the area in 1901. Wow. Jackson had become ill, claiming he'd buried much more that he could not carry. Before he died, he'd given the map to a friend who then gave it to Armstrong, from the article cited in at least nine American newspapers. Mm. Quote, Jackson's description of his find, which is in a creek in a canyon to which there was no outlet except by an underground channel, says in part, In going upstream, I found a place where the bedrock is bare, and you will hardly believe me when I tell you the bedrock was yellow with gold. In a few days I gathered thousands and there was thousands more in sight. Some of the nuggets were as big as walnuts. I saw that there were millions practically at the surface. I buried part of the gold under a tent-shaped rock with a mark cut on the face. End quote. Okay, I've started the car. <laughs> exactly. Over the next few years, dozens of prospectors and treasure hunters began to swarm the area looking for the gold written about over and over in the newspapers of the time and later on in some books. Other articles mentioning the murderous Slumok directly talked about his having died with the location of his secret gold mine locked in his brain. With the legend now firm in people's mind in the late 1920s and early 30s came more treasure hunters seeking Slumok's gold. I can understand why. Like, I'm, I want to go, legit. <laughs> it's, there's a lot of walking. Yeah, I'm not so much interested. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get there. 
One prospector, an 80-year-old named Doc R.A. Brown, or Volcanic Brown. Sweet. I love that. Yeah. Name, from Grand Forks. You could call me Volcanic Brown. Nope. Nope. He'd been looking for Slumox gold for many years. In 1926, he'd become trapped by weather in a log cabin 25 mi miles into the wilderness from Pitt Lake. He was emaciated, and when he was found... He had removed the small toe of his left foot with a hunting knife due to advancing frostbite in his foot. Okay, well, you know, that's good on him. Undeterred, Volcanic Brown continued his search for the gold he believed was there. In 1931, he went missing again. This time he was never found. Oh. The search parties set out to find Brown. He was 86 years old at the time. Man, look, doing all this, cutting off his toe and everything when he's in his late 80s. Yeah, and it's like time to tip over anyway. Yeah, yeah. A camp, believed to be Browns, was found near the foot of Stave Glacier, some 25 kilometers from the northern tip of Pitt Lake. Mm -hmm. A jar containing 11 ounces of coarse gold nuggets was found there. Oh. So that's that's a pretty penny now. Yeah, yeah. Browns' own remains are yet to be discovered. They will be easily distinguishable as he famously sported a set of solid gold dentures. Sweet. <laughs> Can you imagine that guy grinning at you with his grill? He pioneered gold fronts, that guy. That's where all the rappers get it from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Volcanic Brown, what a yeah. great rap name. Oh my God, everything's coming together here. <laughs> He's this a skinny old dude, though. I don't care. Whatever. Volcanic Brown, get whoop, down. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Oh boy. From that point on, every few years was another story of yet another prospector searching for gold and coming up relatively empty-handed. That there were always the teases. Mm -hmm. A dilapidated old log cabin was found with a couple of gold nuggets inside. Perhaps Slumox? Oh, I want it, please. By 1951, the legend had it that 20 people had died looking for Slumox mine, although at the time only three mentioned above were reported in the papers. <laughs> Alfred Gaspard, a 60-year-old prospector from Langley, disappeared. Gaspard, too, had become obsessed with the stories and sought to discover the fortune himself. Why are we not hearing anything about, like, 20-somethings going missing? I know, it's Everybody a lot like of old 60, dudes. 70, yeah. 60 was older then oh. than it is now, oh, I guess. Right, yeah. He headed off into the brush and was never seen again. Others searching for gold enlisted Peter Pierre's family members to lead them to Slomox Gold. But the ghost of Slumok was not pleased. Oh, oh. From the Victoria Times in 1952, quote, Simon Pierre, one of the last old medicine men who died a few years ago, told Chief August Jack Cazzolano that he had other Indians guide a white prospector into the mountain and came face to face with old Slumok's ghost. Oh my goodness. We sat around the fire one night and the ghost of old Slumok appeared. Pierre was quoted as saying, it told us not to take the white man any further. We left the prospector alone and returned. White man went no further, so he lived. End quote. When I hear about ghost stories while camping back in the olden days, I'm always envisioning some rum involved. Yeah, someone's hammered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Slumox curse claimed its last victim in 1960. Lewis Earl Hagbo, 49, of Bremerton, Washington, died of a heart attack in the middle of the trail six miles off the northern tip of Pitt Lake. Oh. As of this writing, there have been many books written, as well as movies and TV shows, all speculating the existence of Slumox Gold and the treasure hunters who still believe it's up there. Some strangely suspect videos on YouTube show men claiming to have found these lost mines. I'll post links to... Uh, all of this stuff in our show notes. There's even been a helicopter crash, non-fatal, containing treasure hunters up on the glaciers above Pitt Lake. Damn. In my research, I also found reference to another mystery with gold involved in that same region. Oh. But this one's a little different. Do tell. It claimed that during World War II, a B-25 bomber carrying Nazi gold that had been recovered in the basement of a European Catholic church crashed in the mountains. Author and prospector Daryl Friesen claims he obtained documents indicating the location of the wreck, which he went to with a camera crew. So I've seen lots of pictures of it, and lots of people have been up there. Okay. But there's no mention of gold in any of these 
no. papers yeah, or yeah. documents. Yeah. It's bizarre for me to think like where, why would a, a Nazi or why would a bomb B-25 bomber uh, be going through BC? Uh, Great question, but it actually did happen. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Well, we've had some like, you know, there was a, what do they call it? A broken arrow yep. uh, in BC. Yep. That was another story that I read about while I was researching. Yeah. This. So, so I mean, you know, there we have, have had bombers crash around here. So Daryl Friesen is willing to send anybody willing to pay the map coordinates of the bomber site so they can go look for themselves. And uh, I don't think that I'll be sending him $40 over PayPal for that. As A, I'm lazy. <laughs> And I would never hike up there. And uh, B, I'm cheap. I would never pay for a helicopter to take <laughs> me up there. And C, a simple Google search and some clicking around gave me the coordinates already. <laughs> I'll also post that in the show notes. Sorry, Daryl. <laughs> I don't know if they're the right ones or whatever, but whatever. Somebody else claimed they were. Regardless, there are some interesting stories and information which we've left out of this Slumok story and his lost gold mine. What? Oh, there's just too much, too much to talk yeah, about. Yeah. Was Slumok actually protecting his gold mine when he gunned down Louis B? Well, I mean, I you know, that would make some sense. Yep. Many who believe in the existence of the mine also think that's so. Slumok said to Peter Pierre that the only gold he'd brought out was that in the shot bag that he'd been ripped off with. Perhaps he was really mining up there and burying it somewhere. Yep. But why not bring it all to town to sell? Well, I guess, I, I mean, it's heavy. Uh, maybe you don't want to be lugging that much all around, not at that time. Maybe you plan to come back with somebody to help, you know. Or, Why continue to hide it? Like paranoia? I, I don't know. Like, what's the purpose of having it if you don't plan to do anything with it? You can't take it with you. Yeah. He was 80 years old when he, uh, when well, he was hung. Yeah, which is like, you know, with age inflation nowadays, that's like, uh, he would have been 140. Okay. <laughs> So what are your thoughts on this, Scott? Like, do you think that he was, uh, he actually had a gold mine up there in them, our hills or, or was it just that one instance that he found some gold? Oh, my, it, my rational self says that that was the only gold he found, but then you do have to say, well, he found gold. Yeah. He found gold. 80 year olds can be pretty cantankerous and maybe he was just kind of like, oh, I'm just going to keep it all. I'm yeah, gonna, there was gonna... there was a guy who lived in my hometown. His name was Lester. Yep. And Lester had this little tiny house and he didn't believe in a bank. Yep. And he had all his money squirreled away somewhere in that house. Yep. When he died, somebody else found it, I guess. It isn't cr it, it isn't crazy to think that he did find more and have it squirreled away somewhere up in the woods. I can't understand why somebody would do that, but I'm not him. Yes. I'm not Slumok. So you weren't I, ripped off. Yeah. For 27 bucks for your $25,000 gold find. And if you do bring it back to town or home to store, it's, you know, security, home security isn't what it, what it is now. You would probably feel more comfortable and safe with it hidden up in the woods than you would with it being in your house and the rumor gets out that you got gold and people are, you know, breaking in and killing you and. So, but uh, you know, I love these kind of stories and I do just get that craving of, oh man, I want to go looking. But part I'm of me, part of me does want to go up there just for fun. Yeah. I, I'm sure though, like within 20 minutes, I'd be like, oh man, it's cold. And, geez, my know, feet and, hurt. Yeah. My, my feet hurt. No, I didn't, we're, we're going to sleep and uh, let's go back. But man, I, it, I want treasure, Mike. So if you're interested in taking yourself further down the Slumok rabbit hole, go to slumok.ca. Do it. Check it for yourself. Yeah. That's it for this week's episode. Uh, before we go, we want to give some shout outs to our new patron patrons. This week's good eggs are Julie Funfer for doubling her monthly pledge. Oh, wow. She's she... from Victoria. Yeah. And we're going to meet up with her at our meetup that's uh, coming near up. Near the end of the month. Yeah, I'm stoked. Uh, Lindsay Hen, thank you for supporting the show. Thanks, Lindsay. Gabrielle Blaise Duchesne from Quebec City, Quebec. Apparently, our anglicized pronunciation of poutine does not offend everybody in La Belle Province. Uh, yeah, had, I saw that. Yeah. We had a bit of a run-in with somebody yesterday who was uh, who wanted to argue. That happens. They were a separatist. It was interesting. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. 
I blocked her. Oh, wow. Thanks to Lisa Moore from Winnipeg, Manitoba. Mm. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. A special thank you to Zoe Jones, another local friend of ours and friend of our, our other supporter, Heather. Oh, sweet. I, I don't know Zoe, but right on. She's she's rocking, rocking good news. Sweet. Thanks to Alexandra Novotny from Huntington Beach, California. And I think I actually just pronounced your name correctly. And that's the uh, Tito Ortiz is from. Huntington Beach Bad Boy is what he called him. So. He's such a ding dong. Maya Newton from Minden, Ontario, and our friend from the Spoop Files. She's upped her pledge to PM status. Whoa! She and Alex, her pod partner, are very kind folks, and they're the ones who brought me the book on Oak Island and the Templar connections when I met them in Toronto. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So there you go. You guys keep uh, keep keep doing what you do with the Spoop Files. Yes, thank you guys. That's another podcast, by the way, so check it out. Do it. Janice J. Mykoski from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Sweet. Is one of our eager beavers. Thanks, Janice. And Mary Steinke from Beauséjour, Manitoba. She came in at our PM level. Holy guacamole. I know, right? Wow. Thanks, Mary. We also had a few PayPal contributors send us some donut money. Sweet. C. Valiquet from Bracebridge, Ontario. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Stasia Pepper, Calistina DeVille, I think I said it correctly this time, because <laughs> we had another conversation about that <laughs> over instant message, and Isabel Couture all contributed to our donut fund, or donut money fund as well. You're all amazing. Thank you. They are rocking awesome possums. No kidding. Possum. Thank you so, so much. Oh, coming up next week, I will be doing two panels at the Vancouver Pod Festival. Squeeze! At noon on November 8th, I will be at Vancouver Public Library, Podcasts After Serial. Oh. So, uh, how true crime has evolved after serial. And on Friday the 9th, I will be doing another panel at noon at the library, and this one will be on From Idea to audio. So from getting mm. your getting your podcast from idea onto audio in, into audio. Yeah. yeah. So those things are free. You can come and see me there for free if you want and shake my hand and that kind of thing. I got to go out for lunch with somebody from Chorus after that, but uh I totally wish I wasn't having to work and I could come and check it out and heckle you. But Ooh. Scott will be there with me at the VIP event. I believe it's on Friday evening between 4 and 6 p.m. That's right. I'm, yeah. I'm going to show face. Thank you so much to our patrons past and present for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of our show. If you want to help us support, if you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash darkpoutine. Or for a one-time support, you can PayPal us some money at darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. Donut money is good. Mm. Check out our website, www.darkpoutine.com for show notes and other exclusive content. Mm. And I plan on uh, sharing some more cool stuff with you. I bought a new new microphone uh, for video. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Oh, is that the road one? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So we're going we're gonna to do some video. Uh, you'll have to look at my fat face a little more. And I'll be yakking at you about stuff. And my twitchy uh, face as well. I, I realized that after watching us on the news that my uh, I, well, my face twitches a lot. Yes, and you're almost <laughs> transparent. <laughs> I'm translucent. <laughs> there you go. Follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine and tell your friends. Come join us at the Umber Yard. That's our closed Facebook group. You can subscribe to us on our, you can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory like iTunes Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or Spotify. That's it for this week, folks. And you know how we sign off, right? I do. Don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.